And the next step is called insight leading to emergence. It leads to emerging from our ordinary worldly viewpoints. Now, a person who has the ordinary worldly viewpoints and understanding and way of looking at oneself in the world is called a putujana, a worldling. And the world is full of those, of course. That's what everybody is, a putujana. And this step which now comes is the one which is the result of all the preceding insights which we have discussed and which we are, have put into the into eight steps with um, additions in each step. One can make it into 16 or 12 or 13, but anyway, very common is eight steps. And this one is the next one. And this one is the culmination of all of those together. Because in the conformity, knowledge of conformity, one had to make the connections, the connections between everything that one has experienced and seen with insight and see how it all fits together. Some of that connection I was trying to make last night with the Noble Eightfold Path, which also connects to all these insights because the right view is seeing things as they really are. And this step now is not anything new what's happening, but it has the impetus to get one away from the ordinary, everyday kind of connecting to a new state. So it's the intermediary between the Putujana, the worldling, and the first step of being an Arya, a noble one, Satapana, Strimentra, which is the first step. These are all just technical terms, but as in every science, we have technical terms in order to know what we're talking about. Science always has for every discipline its own terminology. And this particular terminology consists of repetitive um, concepts. But everybody who is acquainted with that science knows what that concept is supposed to delineate. And here we have exactly the same. Meditation and the Buddhist teaching are signs of the mind. And it is therefore also universal and repeatable. So we have terminology. And because we use the terminology over and over again, everybody who is acquainted with it knows what it means. And one doesn't have to go into a long discussion about it. Now here, of course, we do in order to make sure that everybody knows what it means. Everybody knows what a worldling is. There's no question. We all know what that's like. And a stream enter, we'll get to that in a minute, what that means. We are in the intermediary stage, in, the, in that which brings us there. Now, the worldling doesn't see anicca, dukkha, anatta in every moment. And the stream enter has got the result of having seen that. So here we have the stage where we have seen it, but we haven't done anything really incisive about it yet. We emerge, therefore it's called emergence, inside leading to emergence because we can emerge from the worldly, worldly state. We see at this point particularly three facts about everything 
that is known to us, everything that is conditioned. Now, conditioned means that it can only exist because certain conditions exist. In other words, it's never self-existing. It always has to have a support system. Now, the one thing that really needs a support system is the me. We've already known that. We've already heard about that. We might have actually become aware of it in ourselves that this support system for the me is something that we crave constantly. And if it isn't forthcoming, we very often have great fears and great um, uh, resentments and uh, great difficulties. But that's not all that needs a support system. A house needs conditions so that it can exist. All the things that go into a house, you know, all the things that make up a house, bricks and mortar and wood, all these things are the conditions for a house. We also have to have a bunch of workmen that put it together. You also have to have an architect that makes a plan for the house. And then you also have to have the condition of no fire, no earthquake for it to remain. Well, exactly the same is not only for material things but for this for the person the condition of the body is the craving to be here and this craving to be results in the food that we take because that makes it possible to live and that the elements the four elements of which we consist are in balance. If they get out of balance, we are either very sick or dead. Just imagine the fire element getting out of balance. If it gets out of balance above 104, there isn't much hope, or above 106. The same with the water element. That gets out of balance, we haven't got much hope. All the elements have to be in balance, so there's a condition for this body to exist. It has to have, of course, fluid put in also. It also has to have the outer conditions in order, namely the elements outside of it have to be in order. If there's too much water, it drowns. If there's too much temperature, it burns up or it can freeze up. So all of these things have to have the proper condition. And because it has to have proper condition, there's absolutely no safety. We are always at risk, every single moment. Now that can be seen at that time. And of course the mind, the mind has a condition. Because if we've seen cause and effect, we have seen that the condition of the mind is a sense contact. So with that, all these conditions taking place, we have also seen that not only are they necessary to be there for us to even exist or anything to exist, but there has to be also a compound of them. There have to be several coming together. Now, just to look at the four elements, they all four have to be in in balance. In order for this body to exist, all the bits and pieces have to be in balance. Now, for the mind, we have four again. All of that has to also be there for the mind to be there. If one of them is missing, the mind isn't working properly. If any one piece of the body is missing, anything that's vital to it, it's also not working. So we have compounds. Everything has to work together. Again, none of that is is sure. None of that is secure. If we don't know that, 
then we are just beset by the normal fears. But if we know what we fear, we also know our, that our chaotic reactions to all that is due to that fear. And every worldling, even up to non-returner, has not always, but very often, chaotic reactions because it's so insecure. Now, have not if we don't see that, we haven't got this far. Knowing it this minute is fine. Not knowing it tomorrow, it doesn't. Me it means that one hasn't really seen it yet. Having seen it in oneself, it can't disappear. It's for sure. Now that doesn't mean that compounded and conditioned things, people, existence change when one sees it. No hope of that. They remain exactly the same. The house will always need bricks and mortar and a workman and an architect. And the body will always need food and a balance of the um, elements and all the bits and pieces which are vital to work properly. And the mind will always need its four bits and pieces to work properly. But what changes is our belief that there's somebody there that can actually control us. And that changes when we have seen it. Because having seen it, we actually also recognize why there's so much chaos in the mind. Because there's that constant wish to control. And there's no way to do it. There's only one way of doing it, and that's letting, letting the whole thing go. It's letting it just float away. So we have an understanding of three aspects of everything that is compounded, put together, and also based on a condition. And the first thing that we know about it is that it has impeding qualities. In other words, there's always something that is obstructing us. Now, the body has innumerable aches and pains. It has almost never a complete feeling, when one is aware of it, of the body, complete feeling of total joyous, joyousness in the body. The body, as long as it is just as a body, experienced as a body, has all sorts of things which bother it. And not only that, we have to eat and then that's too much. And then, not enough. And then, digestion. And then, excretion. And then, urination. And then, eating. And then, too much or too little. And then, excretion. And urination. And <laughs> over and over and over. It is no pleasure. It is an a necessary um, action just to keep the thing alive. And it's never getting any better. It's always getting older and worse, no matter what we do. So we have this impeding quality not just in the body, but we have it, for instance, we, we want to be morally perfect. Maybe we have that desire. So we can see that we are constantly at risk, that we're doing something which is not in accordance with the five precepts. It's very easy to do something that's not in accordance with them. Much more difficult to do everything that's in accordance with it. Then we want to be concentrated. And the mind goes off on a tangent. And we would like to 
have complete insight to get rid of all dukkha. What does the mind do? It doesn't see it clearly. One minute it sees it, next minute it doesn't. There's always some impediment. In mind and body, there is an impediment. In other words, we can see now that mind and body, which we call me, can never be totally satisfactory. It just has too many bits and pieces that it consists of, and it has to have exact conditions so that it can even stay alive. So it doesn't really have anywhere to rest and say, I'm safe. It's a totally unsafe situation. Obviously, subconsciously, everybody knows it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be so easily worried, anxious, fearful, upset. Why would we be all these things? Did we know uh, Subconsciously, we know all that. And consciously, we try to find the way out of this dilemma by finding something in the world that's going to make us totally safe, totally secure, and completely happy and peaceful. And that is the absurdity, which is hardly ever addressed, other than in the profundity of the last stages of insight in the Buddha's teaching. There is nothing in the world that is not compounded, there is nothing in the world that is not conditioned. So it is exactly of the same quality as we are ourselves and therefore cannot give us that what we're looking for. So whatever we're looking for in the world is exactly like we are. The whole of the universe, O oh monks, lies in this fathom long body and mind. Everything is made of bits and pieces which all have to work together and hardly ever do perfectly, and there's all conditions which we have no control over. None whatsoever. We have not even control over the condition of our own mind most of the time, never mind what the rest of the world. So with all that, we can see the impeding quality. Now there's another thing that we can see, and that's called the signifying quality. And there's a, it's a quite interesting, there is a statement of the Buddha about signifying quality in one of the very famous discourses, the Mahanidana Sutta, which is the great discourse on dependent arising. Nidana is dependent arising. And dependent arising discourses are many and very often different from each other. They're not always the same. This is a Nidana discourse, this picture here, but it's totally different from this one. I'll read it to you, what the Buddha said. It's quite short. He's talking to Ananda, whom I've mentioned several times, his attendant and cousin. If Ananda, all those modes, characteristics, signs and exponents by which the mind group is designated were absent, would there be manifest any verbal impression of the meta group? There would not, Lord. If Ananda, all those moods, characteristics, signs and exponents by which the meta group is designated were absent, would there be manifest any resistant impression in the mind group? There would not, Lord. And if Ananda, all those moods, characteristics, signs and exponents by which there comes to be a designation of mind and meta were absent, would there be manifest any contact? There would not, Lord. Wherefore, Ananda, this itself is the cause, this is the origin, condition for contact. That is to say, mind and matter. I know. I have to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's not very uh, clearly put. <laughs> it's... It is not a matter of translation. This is actually what the Buddha said. I mean, the, the Pali is translated the, just the way it is. 
But what he's talking about is what is called the signifying quality, or the signifying, yeah, quality. Signs and modes, which consist of time, place, duration, occasion, color, shape, everything that we latch on to, everything that we can experience. All of that are the signs and modes. Modes, you can also say, um, modules, models, signs, everything that is that we can actually grasp. Every, every, everything that we can grasp is a sign. What we can't grasp, we have nothing to do with it. So whatever our senses contact has to have a sign to it so that we can recognize it, otherwise there's no recognition. And it has to have a mode, a form of some sort. Even if it's a thought, we, must, we can't contact it unless it has something that we can recognize. So what the Buddha is saying, now if all this was not there, or all these modes, characteristics, signs, anything that's exposed to us, by which the mind group, which is the, um, the mind group are the four mind uh, aggregates, by which that is designated, that means that if we cannot have any sense contact, because there's nothing there, and no feeling, no perception, and no re uh, reaction to it, Would there be any verbal impression of the matter group? In other words, could we say, have, have any reaction to that which we see as corporality? If the mind didn't have anything to latch on to, could we say this is a flower, is this a tr uh, floor? We couldn't. None of these things would be possible. And vice versa. If all the, if the, all the modes and signs and characteristics of the matter group were absent, could the mind have any resistance to them? Would there be any resistant impression in the mind group? In other words, if none of this was, had a color and a, a place and a time for us, and we could never dislike anything because it would just wasn't, we couldn't grasp it, right? So if none of this was there, then we wouldn't have any resistance, any ill will, anything that we don't like. If all these things were absent, by which we could designate mind and matter, in other words, if anything, if all this was gone and we could not say this is a, such a thing, and the mind could not say, I like it, I don't like it, would there be then any contact, sense contact? There could not possibly be any because there's nothing happening at all. So that in itself is the cause, is the origin. That's the condition for contact, mind and matter. In this case, mind and matter means, of course, here also mind and body. We always have to say that body is matter. So whenever there is the words mind and matter, it's a translation of Nama Rupa, which you can s translate as mind and matter or mind and body. In this case, matter is better, but we must include body also. So what the Buddha is saying, so it's the origin of all this, of everything that arises in the world for us, is because we have mind and body, and with mind and body, we also see matter, of course, there's matter around us. And because of this, of all these characteristics that are there, signs and modes, because of all that, we have then reaction to it. And if that contact wasn't happening, none of this would be happening. So in what he's saying is we make up our own world. We are the ones that make up our own world. There's a, um, there's a little verse I saw the other day. 
think I can get it together. It says there are two people behind bars. One sees the bars and one sees the stars. So we make up our own world. It isn't real. Whatever we make up, that's what we think is real. But we can have 15 people sitting here, and I guarantee you we've got 15 different worlds here. And between those 15 people, we also have each one has a different world each day. And maybe even each meditation session. <laughs> So when we look at that, it becomes clear what the Buddha is talking about. That because we have this whole aspect here, which has arisen through craving, because of that we contact, and because of this contact, because there is all this business of signs and modes and characteristics, then comes everything comes into being. But it doesn't have any absoluteness in it. It is just something that we make arise. In other words, we are creating. We are creating, and some of us are pretty good at creating. We create something nice, and some of us are lousy at it. They create dreadful things. And then we wonder why the world is so terrible to us. Why are we having all these bad things happen to us? But we're creating it. We're making it all up. The whole thing is all made up in the mind. It's how we contact all these signs and modes and characteristics. This is the signifying quality. And with that signifying quality arises the desiring quality. Because a lot, the stuff we like, we want. And the stuff we don't like, we don't want. So we are constantly, not only are we constantly at risk, we are also constantly at work. We never have a moment's peace. Because all of the things that are existing, that we can put our mind to, all have those three qualities. They all have this impediment in it, which makes it not happen properly the way we want it. And it also has this signifying quality. And because of that, it has a desiring quality. So. Sure, we have a nice time when we are in one of the peaceful jhanas, certainly. But I'm sure everybody who has been able to do them knows by now that they too are impermanent. And if they don't know, they'll just have to come back for another month. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not only that, that they're impermanent. They have a condition. They have the condition of the mind being concentrated and the body not being terribly sick, not being too much noise, not it being too hot or too cold, to have been able to, to uh, practice sufficiently. The conditions are unending, actually. And all these conditions are again compounded of several things and because of that they all have impediments in them. That's actually what Dukkha means. That's the translation for Dukkha. Dukkha does, under, does not mean for, an, for a meditator who really wants to get at the truth of the matter, suffering. Because that's old hat. Everybody knows there's suffering. That's not even interesting anymore. This is dukkha. This inbuilt, unsatisfactory condition of the world. You see now, the idea that we have to constantly also create our world. Every morning when we get up, we have to recreate the world around us. Every moment that we have has passed, we have to recreate a new one. And some people are so bad at recreating their world that they're creating an awful world. And some of them are 
sort of mediocre at it. Most people are sort of in the middle, and they have sometimes a good world and sometimes a bad world. And very few people can constantly create a good world around them unless they've had sufficient um, insight and sufficient calm so that the whole thing is no longer an impediment. Because this stuff that we see and that we touch with mind and um, which is matter around us and which the mind then has to digest, none of that has any quality of creating a good world. We have to do that ourselves. There is nothing out there that can do it for us. We can go, we can have, we can be in the most wonderful place and have the most wonderful experience. In fact, people are sometimes uh, even, they have a very good uh, jhana experience and then come and say, uh, oh, I don't know about that. You know, is that really good? <laughs> I mean, okay, it sounds funny, but it's true. <laughs> so we are creating anything we want, anything at all. Now we have these three difficulties that we, but we have to see this. Impediment, then the signifying quality, and then the desiring quality. And with our, um, with the things, for instance, that we have, we also see quite clearly, because everything has impediment in it, it has to be constantly looked after, which includes this body. Just think for a moment what you do every day, just to keep the body in order. And it's not getting any better from that. You can't even keep it equal. It gets worse and worse and worse every single day. And look how many things one has to do just to keep the body in order. So, never mind about things. Everything that um, exists, it, go, uh, it breaks down. It has to be renewed. It has to be cleaned. It has to be looked after. And so, nothing gives real satisfaction. It keeps one nicely busy so that uh, often one can't remember any of this. And one gets so busy that um, one hasn't got time to really think about these things. And then one isn't quite sure why one is so dissatisfied. And then one even might go out and blame others for being dissatisfied or, or whatever one has in mind. One of the sentences in the Kanya Metta Sutta is, not to be caught up in too much bustle. In other words, have a bit of time to look at these things. So um, our, our material world is demanding, and because our material world impinges upon our mental world all the time through our senses, and even through the thinking, I mean the thinking also thinks about the material world, we are constantly in a state of um, where we have to react in some manner or form and where we constantly have to digest. We have to digest it. There's no way out of that. We have to digest whatever comes in and it's always the material world and the material world is never satisfying. There's always something that needs to be done about it. And it also can be that we might, might be desiring or rejecting one of those two. So this is something that we n must see quite clearly because before we can have the first step out of the worldly condition. It's another thing the Buddha said, everything compo compounded rests on a mass of suffering. The world rests on suffering. Now, unfortunately, again, dukkha is translated as suffering. I'm going to read it again and say dukkha. Everything compounded rests on a mass of dukkha. The world rests on dukkha. It's not just 
suffering. It's just all that what I've just explained. And the meditator understands that Nibbana is free from Dukkha. So what we now see is that none of this is satisfying and that there is an understanding that this desire for deliverance now comes about that we are actually willing to let all this go. We no longer have to grasp it. And all this particularly means mind and body. That's all this is the... Having seen that none of this can give us freedom, can give us real peace, can give us that what we subconsciously really want and which we've never quite known where to get it because one has looked in many places and some of us, of us have looked in more places than others but everybody's looked somewhere where one thinks one can get it. We now have to take the Buddha's word for the truth because we have no way of being able to prove it until we've been there. So the Buddha said there is a possibility of having peacefulness and it has to be uncompounded and unconditioned because he shows quite clearly that the compounded stuff which consists of bits and pieces and that which rests on conditions can never bring peacefulness. So he says, but there is something that is uncompounded and that is unconditioned and it's called Nibbana. Just the name. I already said yesterday that it's called non-burning. And so knowing that all this is unsatisfactory, the mind wants to go to that which is satisfactory. Having investigated the three characteristics over and over again by that time, one of those three comes as the most important one to mind. The one who has a great deal of faith usually uses impermanence. The one who has a great deal of concentration uses dukkha. The one who has a great deal of wisdom uses anatta. If one goes through the... if one uses impermanence, anicca, then it is the doorway that we go through is called signless. The one for dukkha is called desirelessness or wishless. No, wishless is better. And the one for wisdom is called voidness. If we use anicca again, now we re arouse that understanding at this time of, let's say, Anicca, then we go through that understanding again that impermanence has the sign of nothing can be grasped because it's going through our hands like quicksand. Everything goes through our hands like quicksand. So we can't grasp anything. So that's signless. It doesn't have those signifying qualities, the ones we've just talked about. No signs, no modes, no characteristics, because it's always moving. One characteristic, but the minute I look away, it's a different characteristic. At this moment, this is green in front of my eyes. I look up there, it's brown. Up there, it's white. Now it's red. And I can't keep staring at that. It's impossible. Nobody can. So all signs, all characteristics, everything moves constantly. And it's not just the seeing everything. And that is the one that we understand through Anicca. By the same token, if we have picked, because we're concentrated, Dukkha. Not because we've been suffering so much. Everybody's been suffering so much. That's nothing. But because we're concentrated, we, the concentration is very often fixed on dukkha. 
because dukkha also pain if there's pain for instance uh, physical pain and uh, one is very concentrated one can use that without getting um, to dislike in it just being concentrated on it so somebody who's very concentrated might have picked dukkha or some other reason for picking it because it seems very um, it seems to tell a lot if we if we use that we realize that we'll never get rid of dukkha if we keep on wanting wanting to know wanting to be wanting to see no matter what it is we have recognized that only being wishless will do it now of course the jhanas help greatly because even in the third jhana we have already noticed or sh- could have already noticed that we are only contented because we have no wishes so any of the jhanas will give um, an impetus to this and if we use anatta as our vehicle as our pathway we will have seen that because of this constant movement everything moving and because wishing to be brings only dukkha and that there is nothing that can completely not only can completely satisfy but but can be said to be complete in itself there's nothing that can be complete in itself we can see that there's nothing really that has substance and then we see voidness to see to experience anatta it is said we go through the doorway of sunyata which is um, sometimes with sunyata is the word that's used in the mahayana tradition and because in the pali tradition we use anatta they uh, it's often thought that sunyata is something more than anatta but anatta means non-self and sunyata means voidness the person who goes through the pathway of non-self sees the voidness there's no no difference in that i'm just putting that in in case somebody has heard this this is not uncommon that it's said that sunyata is a step further than anatta it's all the one and the same thing so that the person that has been it's an analog- analytical person a person that has a, a likes to analyze things uses anatta and sees that with all this that with all this constant input which makes the things arise and they only arise because there is this contact that there's nothing that we can put our finger on and say this is the substance of it all and you, humanity has for centuries always try to find something that they can put their finger on and even if it's not completely imaginary and say that's it that's the substance of the universe and give it some name whatever name one likes to give it because it does seem so well maybe it seems a bit um, unnecessary to be here if there's no substance well it would be unnecessary if we had seen already that there was no substance but until we actually see that there is sunyata that there is no substance until then it's necessary to be here in order to find it one day to see it now we don't have to come back so having one of those doorways will be our pathway and and the next thing that happens is called change of lineage knowledge <coughs> takes a while till we get to the actual jumping over the over the stream lineage huh? lineage. lineage i'll explain it in a minute i don't expect people to understand that without explanation <laughs> what is said is that first we do all this preliminary work 
for insight. And the jhanas are part of that preliminary work. And this preliminary work is stabilizing the concentration in the jhanas and stabilizing each of the insight steps. Now, obviously, we can't all be at the same point at the same time. So if these insight steps have not been stabilized yet, that's one's work that one has to do. But I'm continuing to explain the whole pathway because not only um, some people may make, be able to make use of it, and also when you go away from here, at least you've heard it all, and then you can use whatever you can out of that. So the first thing to do is this preliminary work, which is our um, concentration and all the different steps that we have talked about. Each one has to be totally ingested. There mustn't... Till the previous one has been so taken in that it is a matter of course that we really live with it. Now, if we live with that everything is constantly arising and ceasing, we wouldn't really have any arguments. I mean, what's that to argue about? It's going to go away anyway. And we would also, if our uh, jhanas would uh, stabilize, our five hindrances are so suppressed, if they're really stabilized and we really work, do them every day, they're so suppressed that they wouldn't have any impact on our daily lives. They are still in the, um, they are still there, but they are not coming up. They still have to be uprooted, but they are not any more of such an um, force that they really have any any impact on our relationships and on our uh, reactions. So all that is a preliminary work. The the jhanas and the steps of insight, and each step of insight brings a new feeling about oneself and the world, but the results of it are usually not immediately discernible, because the results only come about when one has gone a bit further and can look back. If one doesn't do this work, then of course one is either stuck to where one was before, or one can fall off again. Up to here, the meditator can always fall off the whole path again, again and again and again, and most of them do. They don't practice at home, they forget any insight they'd had during the course, it doesn't make enough impact to be used in daily life, because one forgets. So one has to do it over again. Up to this point, there's always risk. And the only way we can overcome that risk is by daily practice of meditation, naturally, and by constant practice of substitution substituting the unwholesome with the wholesome and substituting the worldly view with the spiritual view. In the world one gets out of dukkha by having some pleasant sense contacts. In spiritual life one gets out of dukkha by seeing it clearly that none of this can do anything for one, that it just produces more dukkha. So it's a constant substitution of opposites. That's what it's called. It's its, it's um, technical name, substitution of opposites, which is the unwholesome with the wholesome, the worldly view with the spiritual view. And if we do that, 
if we practice meditation, do the substitution day in and day out, there's no falling off. But if one doesn't, then there's falling off again up to here. Because any of these insights, while they can easily be resurrected, but they go into the background of one's um, mental um, components and can't bring them forward. It's like a language you've forgotten. Then you've got to start speaking it again. As you start speaking it again, ah, it all comes back, sure. It's all back there somewhere. It's not a new language to be learned. It's something that is in the mind, but it's way back there. So the longer one doesn't speak it, the more one forgets it. Or if anybody has had that uh, experience of knowing a second language or a third one and not speaking it for a long time, one knows quite well it's, it's gone. And then you have to bring it back by speaking the same with the Dhamma. It's a totally new, different language. Doesn't, it's not spoken in the world. Not at all. In fact, if one speaks it in the world to people who have no interest in it, they sometimes think one has gone off one flocka. Because it's totally different language. So we have to either keep on speaking it all the time in order to keep it going, or not be surprised that it goes in the background and has to be resurrected. That's a preliminary. Then we have access. Access is this. Access is when our understanding of Anicca Dukkha Natya has become so strong that we don't let go anymore. And the conformity that we already had um, talked about, which can see the whole picture. These three lead to the emergence. And at this time, the desire for deliverance becomes so strong that this next thing arises, which is called change of lineage. And that means nothing other than going from a worldling to a noble one. And the lineage is the lineage of the Buddhas. The, um, that what we take refuge in. We do not take refuge in everyone who wears a robe or in everyone who sits on a pillow, which is often mistaken to be the Sangha. The Sangha are those who have changed lineage, who have become noble ones. Noble ones through in taking refuge through becoming fully enlightened. But noble ones are also the first three steps. The first three steps which are stream entry, once returner and non-returner. And the one that we are mostly concerned with would be the first step, the stream entry. From then on we're safe. There is nothing that can get us off anymore. We are in the stream to Nibbana. It is said that such a person only has to have seven more lives, but one can also do it in seven days, one can do it in seven minutes, but um, and the most is seven lives. That's what the Buddha said. Seven is too many. <laughs> what? It's far too many. What? Seven lives. Yeah, far too many. Well, but that's a maximum. But that's the maximum. <laughs> um, the story says that uh, the Buddha did it all in one go under the Bodhi tree. So you, one can do it all in one go. But the, the change is so profound and the change is so enormous that the person then knows. And it has to be um, a knowing which is um, borne out by the complete eradication of defilements. I'll explain that in detail. Anyway, the change of lineage comes from being a puttajana, which is a worldling, to a sotapanna, which is a stream entra. And um, I'm only using those Pali words in case you come across them in some book and then you know that you've heard them before and that's what it's all about. Now it is also said that some people um, cannot go further than conformity knowledge. 
which means they can see the whole thing quite clearly. But when they try to take that step across, it's impossible. Now that's a karmic um, resultant. And very often, as I said, that is the case because they have made an aspiration in former lives, which is either an aspiration for Buddhahood, which makes it impossible to become enlightened at this stage, because it has to be, the Buddhahood has to be all in one go. Or it may be an aspiration uh, to um, help everybody to become enlightened, or some aspiration which is blocking. It may be karma which is blocking bad karma, which one has made in past lives, one knows nothing about it, and which has to first be eradicated. It's also possible. And there's a simile given, which is quite uh, interesting because it is also a sign of the Buddha's time. It has nothing to do with us. The simile is given is that when sailors board a ship, they take along a land-finding crow. And when they lose their direction with the ship, then they send this land-finding crow off to find land and if she finds it she will stay away she will stay there but if she can't find land then she comes back and then they have to send her off in a different direction so we do that little more technological these days we don't take a crow along I think they have radars and all that sort of thing these days um, but what, it, what the simile is all about is that for such a person who has made some aspiration or has some blockage and has sees everything quite clearly, sends the mind off to find safety and security, to find the emergence from Nibbana, uh, for in Nibbana, but the mind comes back. It can't do it. It comes back also, and I have found that not only does it come back because of having made aspirations and that sort of thing, but because it's not doing it quite right. There's a lot of ways of doing it wrong. So that is another reason why it comes back. And the simile of the crow that looks for land here and there and everywhere and then comes back and sits on the masthead again and has to be sent off again is quite a good one because one may have to send off one's mind many times before it actually can um, land. Please don't think Nibbana is a place. <laughs> <laughs> it, we have that difficulty with the language. Huh? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that to the next... Um, actually up to this point everything is still considered to be mundane in Pali Lokutra so we are still worldlings in this up to here now when the next step takes place it's Lokya that's uh, super mundane, out, out of the world. And uh, that is then the change of lineage. And the lineage is the lineage from the Buddha's enlightenment. Now a Buddha himself becomes enlightened without a teacher. And then the lineage starts to become enlightened from the teaching of that Buddha until that Buddha's teaching is no longer available and then a new Buddha comes. But the Buddha becomes enlightened without teacher and everybody else uses the teaching. Now, it may not necessarily mean that one knows about the Buddha's teaching even. There is a possibility of enlightenment for anyone but it always goes along that pathway. 
whether one knows that it's the, that the Buddha has said so, whether one even ever heard of the Buddha, whether one has any interest in the Buddha, it always goes along that pathway. It's never that exactly explained, but it goes along that pathway. And in other words, it doesn't mean one has to be a Buddhist in order to become enlightened, but one certainly goes, the mind only has that ability. The mind has the ability for the jhanas, the mind has the ability for insight, step by step. There is no private, self-made, um, self-induced possibility for the mind to find something new. It all goes along these steps. Now, obviously, in other traditions, such as Christianity or Hinduism, different terminology is used. But understanding or maybe having experienced any of this, that terminology is easily translated and seen to be exactly the same experience. If it wasn't so, if everybody had to find their own way and everybody did it differently, it would be totally useless to teach anything. It's only possible to teach because everybody's mind goes along that pathway. But of course it can go up and it can go down. I mean, there's plenty of room downward too. So, we don't have any guarantees, in other words. This change of lineage has a very interesting simile. I'll f maybe I'll give the simile and then give the practicalities of it. The simile goes like this. Having seen that everything that we know in this world is never going to produce what we're looking for. One wants to go across the stream which divides this world from the transcendental world, from the super mundane world. Now, the stream is a simile. And on this side of the stream, on this bank, there's a big tree. And this big tree has a branch on it. And on the branch, is tied a rope and with the the branch is selfhood the rope is materiality corporality and with the impetus of the practice we run up to that rope and having that impetus we can swing that rope across the stream and being across the stream in the middle so to say that's the change of lineage that's the intermediary step because we have seen it's no good over here I'm going to go over there and having had enough impetus we then swing across to the other bank and let go and fall down on the other bank. And as we fall down on the other bank, of course, we first pretty wobbly, as one lets go of a rope which has swung across a stream. There's a wobbly uh, feeling, and so it's a totally new um, experience, a totally new feeling, and so it's not stabilized. But after a while, it stabilizes. Now, that's a simile given. Of course, we can't do it like that. It would be quite nice. We'd just get a stream somewhere, get a tree and put on a rope and bingo. <laughs> there we are. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, a mind which is concentrated, such as the jhanas, any one of them according to the Buddha, including the first one, which I think from personal experience would have to be very strong um, but according to the Buddha any one of them 
after the jhanas, after any of the jhanas. There is this understanding, not I want to go somewhere else. I don't like it here because it's too much dukkha. Not that at all. That doesn't work at all. Or I want to see what it's like over there. It doesn't work either. The only thing that works is the inner reality of knowing that there is nothing here except mind and body. There's nobody here. That all these things that we see and hear and taste, touch, smell and, and think and all these ideas we have are nothing but the signifying quality of compound and condition, which I've just talked about. That there is nothing in it which is for real. And knowing that, I'm willing to let go of that, that delusion. It's very important to know that we're not annihilating anything except the delusion. We're not annihilating a person. We're not annihilating life. We're not annihilating or denying anything. There's nothing to be denied. It's all the way it is. It's exactly the way it is. But we see it differently. It's no longer personal. It's quite interesting, actually, to see a bunch of people and not see them separately. Anyway, the, the, the idea in the mind is, I have seen this to be just mind and body. I'm willing to give up the delusion. I'm willing to let go of all that I'm hanging on to, which is particularly me. I'm willing to let go of it. And because I have already seen that even the jhanas are conditioned and compounded, they all have conditions, I've already explained that, and therefore can never be totally satisfying. They're only a means, a tool. And we have seen already that the mind, that thinking process, or the experiencing process of the mind, doesn't have to be thinking even, the experiencing process of the mind is dukkha because it's constantly moving and it has therefore friction and all friction is irritation. The mind is sent off like that land-finding crow to there where there is no condition, no compound, total still. I call it the still point. And the mind goes there, or doesn't go there, whatever the land-finding crow can do. And as, the, as if it goes there, it experiences a moment in which there's truly nothing. But it's very special. It's quite different from jhana, and it cannot be thought. It's got to be done. And luckily, it's done the same way by everybody. And that's why there's no private way of explaining it. It either is or isn't. And the owners of confirmation that it was so lies on oneself. If, of course, one has to discuss it with the teacher, but confirming lies on oneself because one knows later. And that, if that happens, if the mind goes to the still point, that's called the path moment. But it has to have an utter and complete giving up of all that one ever thought one is and not craving for anything else. Because if I'm not, con not satisfied with what I am, maybe I 
like something else, wouldn't I? Uh-uh, doesn't work. It's got to be nothing. Absolutely and utterly nothing. Because that is the truth of it. There's nobody here. And there's nothing happening. Nothing at all. And all that rigmarole and all that proliferation and all that worry and all that ideas, how terrible or how wonderful, it's all nonsense. None of it is true. It's all mind-made. We've all thought it up. For what? For nothing. <laughs> and having gone to that spot spot, sorry, no good having gone, having been able to send the mind off to that experience take the word spot off it's one mind moment you never forget it it's um most incisive, makes the greatest impact of anything one's ever experienced, and it has is followed by fruit moment. Pali Maga Pala. Very important words. Maga M A G G A and Pala P H A L A. Maga is a path and Pala is a fruit. And the fruit is immediate. And the fruit of that experience is expressive and decisive. And everybody who experiences it has the same kind of fruit. If that weren't so, one couldn't teach a thing. Private experiences do not exist. There is no private person. There is the universality of Nama Rupa, of mind and body, or mental and corporal. That's all there is. There are private triggers, sure. People react differently to different triggers, but that's way back when, when we're still getting angry. That has no bearing on this here. This is totally universal. All of the meditation is totally universal, the jhanas. And all of the inside is totally universal. There's no uh, personality involved in any of that. So if we have ever had the idea that this is my insight, or my jhana, or my experience, you can change that immediately. We couldn't ever get together on what's really happening. Now, here, the fruit moment is, as I say, universal. Everybody has the same experience in the fruit moment. And, and that's why on all experiences that you have, I question and question and question to find out whether you have had whatever it is you're claiming to have had, because everybody's got the same. So, it is necessary to be wide awake and aware and to know. And uh, tomorrow I will explain in detail what the different results are on those different stages that we can get of that path and fruit and how, how the different, how we review it and how the different defilements go. I think that will be enough for this evening. If you'd like to ask any questions, please do. It might be interesting to uh, explain what we chant every morning with the eight persons. Ah, the eight persons, yeah. Well, I was always wanting, wondering, why doesn't anybody ask? <laughs> Why doesn't anybody ask? I'm trying to figure it out. So, have you figured it out? Anybody figured it out? Well, it was the four types of persons with the 
Suka, hard, Suka, easy, Suka, hard, Suka, easy. But that was only four, and this was always eight. Four, four eight, types eight, of eight, persons, eight, eight, eight types eight. of humans. Four types of humans, eight types of persons, which we are on. Nobody figured it out. That's it, Michael. You go to the top of the class. <laughs> Path and fruit for each of the four stages of enlightenment. Three mentor, one returner, non-returner, arahant, and for each one, path and fruit. I mean, it's just a technicality. But I was wondering why nobody asked, because it does sound strange, no? <laughs> That's right. Yes? Another question. You mentioned earlier in your talk about the access moment. Or can you say a little more about that? Yes. Because that was some kind of glimmer of this mm-hmm. uh, Well, yes. Um, hang on, wait a minute. Um, It says this, that as one picks one of those three, Anicca, Dukkha, or Nata, they sort of um, um, stay with one as one goes through the different stages of insight. One does look at the others, but one always seems to be the most important one. Attention on the breath for just a few moments. Try to think of a moment in your life when you felt real, strong love. But just resurrect the feeling without any referral to the person that may have been present then. Just bring up that feeling. And fill yourself with that feeling. One of the strongest components is self-surrender. Just letting the feeling take over. Feeling of giving and caring, embracing. nurturing be completely encompassed in that feeling.
and find a person you would like to give that gift of unconditional love. and fill him or her with that feeling. Find a person who you think would benefit from your unconditional love, which is neither demanding nor attached, self-surrendering and giving, warm and embracing, and give it to that person as your gift. Find a person who might not have much love in his or her life. And give your unconditional love to that person. Self-surrendering, only giving. Find someone who you think is not very lovable. Forget the judgment and let unconditional love take over without the self. And just give what your heart contains to that person. go visiting all the people you can think of whom you know visit them 
give them the greatest gift you have to give. Let them feel the warmth and the care from your heart. And now go visiting those people who might have a very difficult life. Whatever you can think of. To bring them this great gift that your heart contains. Unconditional. No expectation. No attachment, no wanting, just giving. Let them feel love and warmth and care, nurturing. Remember that moment again when you felt great love without referring to the person that may have been present, just the feeling. And that fill you from head to toe around you, envelop you, and drench you. Anchor that feeling in your heart so that you can have access to it anytime.
may beings everywhere learn about unconditional love.